What should we do with our myths? This is a lecture for the Wellviews um, module in Nordic Citizenship Education. Um, my name is Andrew Thomas and I'd like you to watch this video before Thursday the 23rd of August when we'll have our lesson about this. So what should we do with our myths? Um, I'm, I'm going to run down some um, various approaches to myths, um, just uh, three or four of them, including the one that I think is, is most emphasized in the literature that I've given you to read. Um, but just a, um, a YouTube tip, um, since we're here, um, if you want to get a handle on um, some uh, theories of myths, but also some of the details of the um, of the various gods and stories in, in Norse mythology, um, I can highly recommend the playlist um, Crash Course Mythology, including especially the lectures uh, or, the, or the programs uh, What is Myth, Norse Pantheon, and Theories of Myth. And I'll try and put some links out um, when, I, when you get access to the um, learning platform. But today, just I say, a couple myths um, and a couple um, theories behind them. Okay, perhaps the most well-known uh, Nordic god is Thor, um, and the word Thor sounds like the word for the Norwegian word for thunder. Um, so one of the approaches to myth is um, to identify what is behind these myths, what it is that produce these myths, and uh, maybe um, the stories about Thor are just another way of talking about thunder, or talking about our fear um, when uh, when thunder or lightning. Uh, um, happens and, and the devastation that it can bring. Um, there are lots of different versions of this, of course. It could be about um, the weather, it could be about fertility or agriculture or whatever. Uh, even more so, you could talk, talk about what is behind the myths in terms of human practice, and a lot of people try and link a lot of myths up to ritual. One of the problems with this is that we uh, we know about ritual from, from very different sources. You can read back, you can say that this is a story about ritual just by reading the story itself, but obviously you have no evidence for that until you've got alternative sources that tell you something else about them, like archaeology. And um, it's extremely difficult to link up these two forms of, of data. And sometimes the texts do it themselves. So, for example, um, and the, the, on the Day of Doom, on Doomsday on Ragnarok, when the world comes to an end, uh, Doom is brought on a ship made of, um, of fingernails and toenails. And, and, the, and the texts tell us that, from medieval texts tell us that um, this is why um, people um, always trim their nails, especially when they are in danger of dying, that you should always die with well-trimmed nails. And, and it's a wonderful little and bizarre th um, idea, but we have no evidence whatsoever of anyone um, trimming their nails before they die. <laughs> and, and of course, it would be difficult to know what kind of evidence that would look like. So the point is, you've, you've essentially got two um, bits of evidence coming from very different directions, and it's difficult to put those together. Um, so some um, interpreters, instead of trying to look at what's going on behind the text, they just try and interpret, give a really good interpretation of the text themselves, or the or the myths themselves. And this is what we would call a structural interpretation, where every individual element of the myth is um, seen as a function of the whole of a, of a great big theory of myth. Um, one of the theories which, and, and and these these theories, they draw an, an enormous amount of data, more than we can really deal with at all. Levi Strauss um, wrote these enormous books. Uh, with great proof, uh, exemplary technique, uh, academic technique, talking about uh, myths as um, world tensions, um, as tensions between um, different social factors. Uh, and uh, and Georges Dumézil, um, both of these French uh, thinkers from the mid uh, 20th century, Georges Dumézil saw um, myths, Indo-European myths, all the way from India and Iran, all the way through to Celtic and Nordic uh, mythologies as essentially showing us a threefold uh, s uh, social order um, based on, on kind of uh, religious political leaders and then military um, uh, military gods and then agricultural gods. Uh, and, and, and these are, these are as I say, impressive schemes. Well, they're so impressive that once you know about them, you start seeing them everywhere. And that's maybe the, one of the dangers. You start seeing these interpretive um, schemes everywhere. Uh, and sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Speaking of which, an alternative to this is to say, well, instead of looking at society, let's look at um, these mythologies as, as human endeavor or, or as, um, exam as, as something that um, helps us to come to terms with who we are in the world, uh, with uh, finding our place in the world. So the phenomenological um, technique looks in, in, in the human experience. And of course, the Freud, uh, Freud's um, interpretation of Moses and monotheism, for example, and te totem and taboo uh, are examples of this, where um, he uh, sees a great deal of myth as essentially 
talking uh, ways of for human beings of dealing with their own sexuality. There are lots of other phenomenological um, and philosophical interpretations of the myths. And the great advantage of this is that they take the myths seriously. They're not patronizing towards them. They do think that they are dealing with genuine human problems. The disadvantage, of course, is that objectivity is even more thrown out of the window. Uh, it feels like you get, they, they feel like you're getting the humans um, right, at least, with a more qualified um, idea about what humans are. But at the same time, I never tell lies quite so much as when I'm talking about myself. So maybe talking about humans was not the best way of preserving our objectivity. So what is an alternative to this? Well, instead of saying and talking about my interpretations and, and how I feel about the world and, and talking about my society and reading um, and reading uh, analyses of society back into this, what we can do is to say, well, whether we uh, whether they're right or not, this is the way these inter these myths have been interpreted, and that's certainly historically robust. You, you're not very um, subjective when you're just reading about other people's interpretations because they're whether you like it or not, they're interpreted and they made these interpretations. Uh, you don't have to say those interpretations are right, but you can at least observe the interpretations. And it's uh, concrete and it's robust and it's definitely real. Um, but is it reductive? Is, is it maybe are we kind of abandoning the the um, are we abandoning the project at all? Are we saying that these mythologies are just um, are just something that other people interpret later on? So. You could um, you could absolutely look behind these myths. You can look inside these myths um, to look at their structure, and you can look at the humanity within them. But perhaps the least speculative interpretation is to look at how they've been interpreted afterwards. But then the danger is, of course, that we um, we have stopped interpreting the myths themselves, and we're looking at the societies that came afterwards. And and that is a historical challenge. But I kind of want to stay a little bit longer with uh, what do these myths mean, um, and we'll be looking at both the um, source of these myths and the and the um, and the content of these myths um, and and what we can um, and how we can interpret uh, interpret them in class. I'm looking forward to meeting you.